Hey, I would like to now call the March 17th, 2021 Longmont Sustainability Advisory Board meeting to order. Can we start with a roll call, please? Yes, Kate Collardson. Present. Mary Lynn. Present. Adam Reed. Present. Jim Metcalf. Present. Charles Musgrave. Present. Kay Volmeyer. Present. Uh, staff member Lisa Knobloch. Present. Annie Noble. I'm here. Francie Jaffe. Here. Uh, Tim Ellis. Present. Heather McIntyre is here. Susan Bartlett. Here. Uh, Ann Lutz and Phil Greenwald. Here. And Council Member Christensen. Here. Chair, you have a quorum. All right, perfect. Um, then the next item on the agenda is to approve the minutes of the last meeting. Uh, does anybody want to make a mo motion to approve? I move to approve the minutes from February 17th. I second the approval All or second favor. the motion. <laughs> All in favor? Aye. Aye. All right. Aye. Aye. We've got a unanimous approval there. All right. Um, so the next uh, item on the agenda is uh, public to invited to be heard. Um, I will now open it up for uh, the public to inv invited to be heard. Each person wishing to speak will have uh, w three minutes uh, for comment. You'll be unmuted to speak one at a time. Uh, when it is your turn to speak, uh, please state your name and address for the record. And I will be timing you. Um, and please do, when, when you hear the alarm, please do uh, conclude your comments. All right, Chair, we have, first up is Doe Kelly. All right. Can you hear me? We can. Okay, uh, this is Doe Kelly of, of Barbary Drive in Longmont. Um, March 11th, 2021, letter to the editor, Loveland, reporter Harold. What happened in Texas can happen here. The power outages in Texas during the recent cold snap can happen here. On Valentine's Day, our power supplier, PRPA, was faced with a pending power shortage as the demand for electricity reached a new winter peak. Weather conditions had shut down its wind generation, snow covered its solar panels, and natural gas for its peaking units was in short supply due to home heating demands. Now that was just a short excerpt from the piece, but learning that the same thing nearly happened here as in Texas ought to give each of us serious pause. I have an assignment in this life, and I don't exactly remember taking it on, but as I learn more about my personal human design, I come to realize that incarnating at this time has to do with being an alpha leader of my pack, addressing survival issues for the pack, and using very specifically my voice in the service of the greater good. Ironically or not, I have a degree in voice performance. I'm a lifelong singer, but a reluctant recent activist. And the human race is my pack, so I can't help it if I'm concerned with all of us surviving the additional microwave assaults we face from AMI smart meters in our communities or the advent of 5G, fifth generation wireless in neighborhoods and even from the sky. Getting back to Texas and Colorado on Valentine's and speaking with my friend Tim Sheckley, an internationally recognized expert in wired and wireless telecommunications and specialist for many decades in home automation, which includes energy efficiency and management in the home. I've come to understand if we were to adopt another model of energy management based on what his joint international standards committee has been working on, we would find ourselves on much better and more secure footing while reducing our energy footprints. I took some notes from Dr. Shekely, too many to include, but I will send them to Heather so she may share them to each member of the group. But first two definitions, HEMS or home energy management systems and DERS or distributed energy resources, which are small scale power generation sources located close to where electricity is used. Here are a few of the notes. Number one, doing HEMS is a much more efficient yet if difficult yet efficient mode of energy management than AMI. Number two, to implement HEMS, Longmont would need to imitate Holy Cross and Basalt, 
a pilot program recommended by NREL of Golden with a whole lot of technical and possibly government help from NREL, which is the National Renewable Energy Labs number three, Tim's Joint Standards Committee with emphasis on the group is working on the recipe book for building a manufactured mass producible version of the basalt project. They are working feverishly against climate change to publish this cookbook Number four, this joint international committee is top of the pile as regards international standards. And my addition to this, Longmont would do, could also do a pilot utilizing Tim's project called Emma. We have choices. There's not just one game in town. And why would we not utilize an expert's expert like Tim, who's here? The new is coming. Let's make way for the real energy future in Longmont. We citizens deserve and should demand an energy system that doesn't leave them in the dark and in the cold. And I'll send you the rest by email. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have um, Scott Cunningham. Okay, can you hear me? We can. Okay, awesome. My name is Scott Cunningham. I reside at 3771 South Narcissus Way in Denver. I'm a practicing integrative internal medicine physician. My purpose in, a draining, in, in addressing the sustainability advisory board is to empower the council to launch an effective and safe 100% uh, renewable energy pilot, which will become a template for Longmont's renewable energy infrastructure. This will fulfill the dictates of RE5 of the Climate Action Recommendation Report, which requires a small-scale renewable power generation and storage pilot by 2021, recently updated to 2022, according to the electrification work plan. I'll cut to the chase. Is the Wireless Advanced Metering Infrastructure, AMI, truly the cornerstone for Longmont fulfilling the requirements of RE5, distributed energy resources in a timely fashion? Here's what Longmont's proposed $16 million AMI meter purchase will buy. Since AMI meters are not designed to distribute or, or enable storage of solar energy, they will not bring Longmont any closer to its otherwise reasonable goal of a small uh, scale solar generation and storage pilot within the required deadline. So if, if AMI meters are not the answer, what is the answer? I suggest that the answer is a comprehensive solar energy generation system with storage capacity and distributive capability, which requires a wired controller that automatically enables houses within the neighborhood to share power in real time, creating reliable energy for everyone within the community. It bears pointing out that the bi-directional controllers utilized in this real life system are much different than the proposed AMI meters, which provide only a metering function, but no means of distribution or storage. In short, it turns out that AMI meters are not the cornerstone feature its vendors have promised. I've spoken to city council recently about giving council access to a credentialed group of renewable energy system consultants holding a track record of successful project completions using the exact system I've been referring to. Here's my challenge to you. I suggest that as custodians of Longmont's future, city council cannot afford to miss this opportunity to give Longmont the region's first 100% renewable pilot while first mover advantage is still within reach. I invite city council to reach out to me directly and we can arrange a detailed presentation by these exact consultants in the very near future. Thank you. And last we have Ginny Black. Hi, can you hear me? We can, go ahead. Thank you, okay. Um, hi, I'm Jenny Black, 2609 Elmhurst Circle in Longmont, speaking today for the Longmont chapter of Citizens Climate Lobby. Good afternoon, members of the Sustainability Advisory Board, and happy St. Patrick's Day to those who are celebrating. Thank you for considering further our request to forward a resolution of support for the Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act to the Longmont City Council for their own consideration. 
We appreciated the discussion following last month's presentation. It will help us to better advocate for this policy in our March lobby days, which will be taking place next week. The headlines today under breaking news in the Washington Post read, Biden administration to make reckoning with climate risk a priority finance factor. Carbon pricing is getting increasing attention and we would like to see it included in the backbone of their climate package. The Energy Innovation and Carbon Dividend Act is a carbon fee and dividend policy, placing fee a fee on carbon at the source and returning that fee to American residents. This carbon pricing approach has been shown to be fast, effective, good for the economy, durable, and fair. We believe that such a policy would accelerate Longmont's climate action goals and support its desires for a just transition. Supporting it would help to build the political will necessary to pass effective legislation that will drive the transition to renewable energy. Looking forward, we would like to extend an invitation to those in the business sector to attend a virtual Business Advocates for Carbon Pricing Conference on April 13th, and an invitation to all to join us for our virtual CCL conference, June 12th and 13th, which will precede our June lobby days. Thanks again for your consideration. Thank you. Okay, um, the next item on the agenda is um, agenda revisions and submission of documents. Uh, does the staff have any revisions or anything to bring up? No, okay. Uh, we will move on to general business. Um, so I, I will ask board members to please hold questions and comments until the end of each presentation after staff has finished presenting. Um, so first up is the end of year sustainability climate action progress report. Uh, Lisa, the floor is yours. Yeah, thanks everyone. Lisa Knobloch, sustainability program manager. I am going to, let's see, can you all see that okay? Yes, all right, technology for the win today, hopefully. Um, I apologize, I had hoped to send the progress report out to you all prior to the meeting for you to review, and um, I think overestimated our ability to as quickly internalize this new format template as I had hoped, so I just finished it up yesterday, so I apologize for that, um, but I will send it all to you all after this meeting. And we were supposed to go to city council to provide this progress report on um, March 30th, but that's, that got bumped out. i um, waiting to hear back for when that date will be. Um, but what we do wanna do today as we go through this is um, for you all to be thinking about your feedback. And then Francie is gonna be taking some notes that we'll pull up at the end that you all can approve that we can send as a memo to city council along with this report. So let's, oh, oh, technology, there we go, okay. So just a reminder for, for everyone, we had been doing quarterly reports, which were um, sustainability reports, which were just big massive spreadsheets that nobody really utilized that much. And so with the approval of the Climate Action Recommendations Report, uh, we suggested moving to uh, a biannual report and incorporating climate action into our sustainability reports um, so it'll be a mid-year and an end of year report with a transitional report in the springtime of this year that we can help, that we can capture kind of 2021 accomplishments as well as progress to date on uh, the 12 near-term climate action recommendations. We are making a more visual report and really focusing more on metrics and highlights rather than every individual um, strategy that we have been looking at before. And again, just to remind you all, you, this group was tasked with review and appraisal of those reports. So we're gonna run through the report as I mentioned, and then you all um, will be able to draft a letter of, of approval or appraisal to send to city council along with the report. So just very high level climate action progress. We've met with staff, the lead staff of all 12 of the near-term recommendations and developed high level action plans that cover these primary areas of a timeline of um, primary activities and milestones, 
introducing the equity process that um, we've talked to you about before with the equity checklist that was developed um, based on the recommendations from the Just Transition Plan Committee, identifying metrics, and then starting to talk about budget and staffing needs for 2022 and beyond. Uh, these are the 12 near-term recommendations. Just as a reminder, we went through these at our last meeting as well, so I'm not gonna go into them. I do wanna note that in the report itself that I'll um, pull up in a minute and run through with you, we don't um, show progress on every single one of these. I just tried to, cause some of these are existing programs that we're just continuing and working on expanding or there's not much happening. So we had limited um, space to try to not get too text heavy. So I really just tried to pull out some key highlights, but I wanna remind you of these. And then I will, after we go through the main report, um, just touch on the progress of the rest of them, just so you all have the full picture of where we're at with implementation of climate action recommendations. So with that, I'm gonna hand it to, I'll stop sharing and Heather is gonna pull up the actual report and then I'll jump back to this. Yeah. Great. So this is our new um, reporting format. I think it came out really nice. We worked with a graphic designer who's helped us with a lot of our sustainability outreach materials. Um, so this front cover page won't change too much other than the date at the top and the report highlights down at the bottom that just kind of show what's covered in this current report. Um, and this will all be translated into Spanish and then posted on our website after these are completed. Um, all right, Heather, you can scroll down to the next page. There we go. So we kind of broke it into sort of three conceptual areas around community prosperity and then a whole focus on climate action. Um, the community page, I'm not gonna go into great detail because a lot of these um, key activities and accomplishments I talked about at the last meeting when we did our kind of 2021, 2020 progress. So it's just showing um, neighborhood sustainability work, uh, the, the achievements that we've made in our electric energy savings and our household trash consumption, um, and then our work around community education and engagement. Um, so that's our conservation campaign that Francie has been running. And then community resources, this is just information about um, things like the farmers market, the WIC farmers market program that we provided funding for last year. Um, you can scroll to the next page there. Uh, the prosperity section is focused mostly on uh, the economic vitality area of the sustainability program. So we have our numbers around sustainable business program participants and the support that Bernice has been providing to um, businesses in COVID recovery. Um, the community grants that were part of the sustainability tax um, money that we use to support the neighborhood impact granting program in partnership th with the Longmont Community Foundation that we've talked to you all about before. And then also this number, I don't think that we have um, shown to you, but this is pretty significant, almost a million dollars in grant funds that um, Atra Nusra, who's our uh, grant and program coordinator, has helped to bring in to support a number of different things such as renewable energy at the wastewater treatment plant, electric vehicle charging, um, parks and greenways, maintenance and restoration, bicycle wayfinding, and outdoor space for Main Street businesses during the pandemic. So in the eight months, now I guess it's almost a year now that, that Atra has been with us. It's a pretty um, significant amount that she's been able to support either write grants herself or support other staff in bringing grant funding in to support sustainability. So I did wanna highlight that because I think that's pretty incredible. Okay, you can scroll to the next page. So this is where we'll spend the most time um, around climate action. This has two pages devoted to it. The top two areas are just the high level are where we're at with our greenhouse gas emissions and the focus on equity, and then um, highlights from the topic areas themselves. So as we've talked to you about before, last year we completed the update to the greenhouse gas inventory that showed an 8% decrease in our greenhouse gas emissions, um, which is great, but also due, due in part to our activities. So that's a good thing, but also due in part to changes in the um, inventory methodology in terms of calculating specifically our emissions related to um, DIA. 
Um, so that's a good thing to note, but also there's kind of an asterisk along with that. Equity and climate action, as I mentioned, the um, Just Transition Plan committee recommendations have been adapted to a che equity checklist that we're using uh, in implementation of our climate action recommendations. We renamed or the group renamed from the Just Transition Plan Committee to the Equitable Climate Action Team and they've since developed their 2021 objectives and are continuing to support um, us in equity and climate action. Um, scroll down a little bit Heather to the energy section. Um, so I did end up combining, if you all remember in the climate action recommendations report there was building energy use and renewable energy. I combined both of those into an energy section because that seemed to make sense. And um, so we didn't kind of chop it up as much. Um, I did include our 2020 electricity mix over on the side and this green check mark, I do wanna just note here, actually needs to be modified. This was what we had reported to you all at the last meeting that just over 50% of our energy supply is renewable. Um, that was a little bit, I, I just need to clarify that a little bit that that was a, a projected number based on kind of a snapshot of our 2021 energy mix. Um, whereas the actual numbers now that we're into 2021 and we have our full 2020 delivered energy mix is actually 43% renewable. Um, so it's, it's a little bit lower um, and we don't have the full forecast yet for our 2021 numbers. Uh, and then if we look at not just the, the energy that's delivered to Longmont itself, but um, PRP's PA's full energy mix, including their surplus sales, that renewable number as it is at 33%. So I will make that modification to this um, report here, um, but I just wanted to note that clarification for folks. Uh, we kicked off the electrification process and Susan Bartlett from LPC is here. She's going to talk to you about that in more detail next. Uh, we've implemented the commercial building benchmarking program. Uh, so Debbie Seidman from LPC kicked off that project uh, last year with a demonstration project where they looked at um, 10 commercial and 10 municipal buildings. And this year they launched a voluntary program for commercial and industrial buildings greater than 20,000 square feet. Uh, and over time, that program will be available to um, smaller buildings as well. Uh, the DERS team, so Distributed Energy Resources, has been working in partnership with Platte River and the four member communities. Uh, that process launched in 2020. Uh, they did some stakeholder outreach uh, through 20, late 2020 through a community survey, which I believe you all received information about. And they're about to kick off a second round of stakeholder engagement in April and May, and then they'll have their final um, plan in mid-May. So we'll keep you all uh, updated on that process. And Heather, you can scroll to the next page there. In the adaptation and resilience area, we launched the climate risk and vulnerability mapping project. Um, again, that was one of the projects that's supported by the sustainability tax funds for 2021. So we've talked to you a little bit about that uh, before, um, but just to re remind you all that's um, looking to create an online tool that will map climate um, a number of different indicators to show climate risk and resilience and vulnerability to climate impacts to help us um, prioritize areas um, for climate impact mit mitigation, um, planning and targeting uh, resources to help build resilience. In the ed education and outreach sector, uh, we've launched the Big Picture Climate Series. It's gonna be a part of Earth Week in partnership um, with the museum and with KGNU and Sustainable Resilient Longmont. So look for information that's gonna be coming out about that. It's gonna be a great week of programming. The museum has really done an awesome job pulling a lot of that together. And then also part of Earth Week, the ECAT, it's what we call it, the Equitable Climate Action Team is gonna be hosting a presentation and panel discussion on equitable climate action. And then lastly, in the transportation section, uh, the majority of our recommendations are either monitor over time or our midterm strategies. So we didn't really have anything to report in terms of near-term implementation. Um, but I did wanna note the completion of the equitable climate free or carbon free transportation roadmap, which you all are familiar with um, because that is a big component of our climate action in the sector of transportation. 
Uh, so that's the, the main report there. This is what will go to council, uh, again, with that one modification um, to our electric energy mix. And then Heather, you can stop sharing and I'll bring my screen back up. And then I'll just really briefly, whoops. There we go. Um, go over the remaining strategies that I didn't cover. Again, just so you all have the full picture of where we're at with climate action. And then I'll have Francie um, pull up the memo document and we can take some, from, some notes on feedback and comments from, from you all to share with council. So in the adaptation and resilience section, um, the climate risk and vulnerability mapping project is really some pre-work to this public health and a warming climate uh, recommendation. And then the plan itself, the public health plan that that recommendation calls for will begin in, in 2022. The flood mitigation, flooding mitigation and preparedness recommendation was determined to be monitored over time. Sorry, I know this is pretty text um, heavy, but the building energy use section, uh, we right now are um, the 2021 building codes have been released and staff is, is reviewing that. And they're gonna be looking at that recommendation of including things like solar and electric vehicle readiness um, into that process and determining whether or not it makes sense to include that in this cycle or in the next code cycle. The electrification plan, which again, Susan will be talking about benchmarking, which I already mentioned. Commercial and energy efficiency and energy, sorry, commercial efficiency and rebates um, is an existing program that we're working to increase through um, marketing efforts in 2021 expanding the low income residential energy efficiency program. So if you recall, this goal was to expand this program from 40 homes per year, which is about what we're doing now to 400 homes per year. year. Because of COVID, this was pretty, pretty well put on hold for 2020. And so what, what we're doing in 2021 is to just keep that goal at, at 40 homes per year and look at budget and staffing needs for 2022 to start that increase. Um, next year. Uh, we are hoping that in-person visits will begin again sometime in April. In the Climate Action Fund and staff, um, we've met internally twice now just to start talking about some potential revenue sources for this fund. Um, so we're just having some brainstorming conversations at this point in time. Um, and then any viable um, sources will need to be really vetted and then taken to council for discussion and direction. Education and outreach, I mentioned the climate lecture series, the sustainability liaison program. Um, we're really looking right now at how best to um, integrate this recommendation with existing neighborhood-based um, programs such as SOL and Sustainable Neighborhood Solutions, and then really looking to see how we can collaborate with uh, the ECAT, the Equitable Climate Action Team, since they have a spe specific objective focused on uh, community engagement. Land use and waste. So the one year term recommendation here was commercial and residential composting. Uh, we're gonna be looking to incorporate that recommendation into the broader waste diversion work that council has given us direction on uh, in February. And we'll update you on that specifically as that work evolves. Renewable energy, smart meters. Um, so they're currently putting out a request for um, proposal and that'll probably, that work will probably start um, in the second quarter of 2021. Uh, and they should have a more definitive timeline later this year. So there's not, um, there's some work happening there, but not a whole lot of details as yet. The DERS I had already talked about. And then in transportation, um, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure recommendation was determined to be monitored over time. So those are, that's kind of the big picture of where we're at in terms of climate action work. So I'll stop sharing this screen. And then Francie, I'll have you pull up that memo document if you could. Oh, it didn't, did it not pull in the letterhead and everything? I think probably it, it, because it's in the web version, it doesn't show up in there. Okay. Um, well, this does have the, the letterhead and it has the um, sustainability advisory board at the top. Um, but what I did was just essentially draft an opening 
statement here it says the sustainability advisory board was tasked with reviewing and appraising progress made on the climate action recommendations developed by the climate action task force and the climate action recommendations report and then staff reviewed progress to date along with the new reporting format at the march 17th meeting upon review of this information we find that and then i'll open it up for you guys to give us some comments and then um, we can approve this and i can send this along with the report to city council if this works for everybody. Are there any questions on any of that? Nope. Okay, please report, I hope. Um, so okay. I'll open it up for discussion. So what I, I suppose kind of first and foremost, do how do people feel about kind of, I mean, where the climate action recommendations report was approved, formally and approved in December. So we're only a couple of months into our implementation of the 12th near term recommendations. So there's not a whole lot to share yet, although I would say there's a lot of work happening. Um, but if folks feel um, like they're satisfied with that progress, are there any areas where people want to see us put more focus on or people feel kind of good with where things are at? And then we'll come back for the mid year report in probably July ish. Hey, but Francie, can I get you to stop sharing your screen real quick so we can see? And Polly has a hand up. Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, Polly. You're muted. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you, Lisa. And there, there's <clears throat> never um, uh, a dearth of information. So the more information council gets, the better as far as I'm concerned. But um, last night we did get a um, an update on the beneficial building electrification feasibility committee and planning, which which gave us a, a small rundown of the overall progress. And of course, everybody understands that um, nothing has gone as planned this last year and <laughs> It's going to take a while. So uh, we all understand that. Um, and I'm glad you're just doing this twice a year because there, there really isn't a need to do it more than twice a year. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted to update you on the fact that we have chosen a couple of liaisons um, for that uh, the electrification committee last night. And uh, I appreciate that report. Um, because it also included all the comments that were made by this, the transportation committee, the sustainability committee, and one other, I don't remember which one. And that was very helpful. Um, anyway, so the, the liaisons for that will be Marsha Martin and Joan Peck. And I, I would volunteer, but I'm term limited in November, so. <clears throat> um, Anyway, I, I appreciate that. I just wanted to let you know that we already have gotten part of that report. Thank you. And yeah, Susan will will be up, up next to talk to this group about that process. Other comments or okay. feedback? This might be a thing I missed maybe last fall. Um, but sorry, I'm going back to your graph with the PRPA, and this probably has little to do with your actual report, which I thought looked fabulous, by the way. I love the format um, and the, the presentation was easy to follow, and except for when I got distracted by this graph. Um, <laughs> and I was just gonna know, I, I saw 0.4% natural gas and 40% coal. And I think it's great that they're filling in the rest with solar and wind and such, but I feel like I feel like I had this like side expectation um, that we were moving away from coal a little more here. And I know that the goal is to also move away from natural gas to more renewables. But the I want to say just and I'm looking I, I was like Googling PRPA over here on the side like, wait, what is Rawhide doing? And we're, I mean, we're not, it looks like they've got the natural gas units up and they can kick out the same amount um, from my understanding. I, I, well, I want to say, I don't, I don't think the natural gas price shot through the roof or anything. Um, and I know coal is always cheap, but coal itself is like 30% of the emissions 
period. You know, when you break it down and people are like, all right, you know, oil and gas, bad, all this stuff all the time. You know, I look and you look at the graph and it's like, no, actually coal, electric, electrical by coal is the number one source of emissions. Then comes your trucks and traffic and then comes the rest of everything else. But I, I, I just had the question, like, I know we're trying to get to 100%, but are they going to leave the coal online until we get there or are they going to pull it and make a transition? And did I, I might've missed this last fall or maybe I just forget things and I'm re-reminded, I don't know. But I just had that, just a question. I see Polly shaking heads <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, just anyway, I figured I'd ask and, and, and maybe that is something that needs to, maybe that's a spot where it wouldn't be bad to put a little push on somebody because- yeah that's yeah anyway any so, thoughts? yeah yeah so that's and I can share that I, I enlarge this graph and I can share it to you all so you can just everyone can see kind of what the current again this is 2021 delivered energy can you all see oh no I always there we go um so this is the current breakdown as of the end of 2020 um and I if you if you all recall, and I know we've talked a lot about, and this is kind of one of those things that, that, that is a complicated subject, but Platte River Power Authority did just approve their most recent IRP, which is their integrated resource plan a couple months ago. And I have it on, on the agenda to bring them to this group sometime in the next couple of months to give you all an update on what that IRP says. Um, because that, that is the plan that says what PRPA's plan is to get us to 100% uh, by 2030. Um, yeah. And currently, they're looking at, they, they feel pretty confident they can get us to at least 90% or above. Um, you know, again, they're projecting out 10 years and they, with the caveat that at the next IRP, we should have more information around some of the technological advances that should be able to actually get us to that 100% goal. But they do have a commitment to bring all the coal plants at least offline by 2030, but it'd probably be best for someone from PRPA to come in and speak to you all directly about that. Because yeah, that coal yeah. chunk is, is a big, is a big yeah, chunk. It, it yeah. is a big, chunk and I even even where I'm seeing purchases again it's you know well I don't know that purchases could be gas it's, could be it's knows? variable yeah yeah, yeah it, it's, it's variable so I'm going we could technically have close to 50 percent coming in from coal alone here and I just I guess I'm like yeah and I'll say for on their on their defense if you're making a transition and you're going to take everything offline but renewables eventually I you know there is some cost efficiency in it but it's also if you're looking at a long-term goal you know, I, I'm sitting there going, personally, I'd take the gas for 20 years over the coal for another 10. Um, but that's, you know, yeah. anyway, just thoughts. And I'm looking forward to them coming and sharing the update. So thank you, Lisa. Yep. Yep. All right. Oh, one, one, but please document nice format on the report. And <laughs> I do think it was well presented. And thank you. <laughs> that uh, it was a uh, good, good, good job. <laughs> <laughs> Other comments or feedback? Yeah, I see. I can only use, I can't see everybody, but I see Polly's hand. So. Oh, at, why don't you take Adam first? He's, okay. he had his. Adam. Sure. Yeah, I'll just follow up with Kay. I really appreciated the report and the presentation was really great. One question I had was, did you mention if this addresses any gaps or potential gaps um, and areas that might need to be looked at further? No, it, it, it doesn't currently. Oh, there we go. Thanks, Heather. Heather reminded me that I can put it in gallery view when we switch back. I'm so used to using Teams now. Okay. Um, it, it doesn't identify gaps. Um, this is really based on the climate action recommendations report and the existing sustainability plan. We, as we've talked to you about, I think at the last meeting, when we look to do the update to the sustainability plan and envision Longmont, that will be part of that process at that point to identify, you know, where, where are our gaps and where do we need to increase our focus? So that's not included in, in this report. Um, but I can make a, we can make a note of that on the feedback that we want to make sure at least to, to flag that for um, the sustainability plan and envision updates. 
them. Yeah, Charles. Yeah, uh, two, two points. Um, again, uh, thank you for that presentation. That was great. Good to see, uh, even though it's only been a couple of months that progress is already being made. Uh, a couple of quick points. Um, so related to what Kay was saying, um, I, I've, uh, in our energy mix, I, it's been kind of um, challenging to get clarity on exactly what Platte River's um, commitment is. Um, for example, if you look at their webpage and look at their guiding principles, it says, quote, consider environmentally progressive technologies to meet future generation needs. It doesn't, it just says consider. <laughs> <laughs> and so um, it would be great. Um, I don't know how this fits into our uh, progress, you know, the climate action progress report itself, but I think one thing that would be great would to get, be, to get more clarity on exactly what they're going to do. Um, for a number of reasons. One is, um, you know, with the investment that's going to be made in these technologies, um, you know, they could become stranded assets, you know, and they're, they're, and who's going to be stuck with the costs of these things. And they're going to be generating um, power to the, to the degree that they are used um, in a way that's not climate friendly. And so it'd be great if we could get more clarity. I don't know if there's something we can do in the report <laughs> to, to, or to talk about that. And then one other thing, I had a question. You mentioned something about monitoring when you're, you said monitoring when you're talking about the, uh, I think, uh, charging stations for charging stations for EVs. I wasn't quite sure what that meant. Yeah, so, well, to your first point, I think that um, that bringing PRPA in to talk about the IRP hopefully will shed some more light on the clarity about what their plan is, but I think we can include something in this memo of the, that the board wants to continue to engage with, with Flat River and make sure that they are following the, the stated goals. Um, so we can include that in, in this memo. And then they, when um, staff went through the evaluation process of all of the climate action recommendations to um, determine essentially the implementation timeline, there were a handful of recommendations that um, due to some some different either constraints or um, situations that we identified to monitor those over time for the feasibility of implementation. And the, the electric vehicle charging infrastructure was one that was identified to monitor over time, um, mostly because the EV market is still developing and there are a lot of unknowns currently around the impact of downtown charging infrastructure on the adoption of electric vehicles. And so uh, staff really felt like it made sense to just keep an eye on that for right now, rather than jumping to installing, paying to install 20 EV chargers, which is what the recommendation had called for. So that's okay. that recommendation. Understood, thank you very much. Yeah, so when, just a little bit of a concern on that is that, um, yeah, so the electric, electric vehicle um, adoption curves are growing very quickly. And so uh, we're going to see exponential growth in that pretty soon. The issue, one issue is that um, people who can charge at home, who own homes or who rent homes mm -hmm. are in pretty good shape in terms of being able to take advantage both of the um, advantages of electrical vehicles and the, the dropping costs and they're much, much cheaper to operate and maintain, et cetera. But um, the challenge is when you have people who live in apartment complexes, for example, where they don't have the ability to charge at home. And so preparing for um, a future where we can have a kind of an equitable access to, um, to uh, electrical vehicle charging. So those who, are, who own homes are in pretty good shape, but the maybe lower income families who actually in the long term would benefit the most from an inexpensive electric vehicle um, they're going to be at a disadvantage if we don't build that infrastructure. So, so anyways, I know we're in the, you, you mentioned monitoring there, but at some point it'd be good to get that into, um, from monitoring to, you know, how do we plan implementation? Yep. And I think part of that, um, is in the, is in the transportation roadmap as well. And I see, um, so we can add that note in the memo. Mary Lynn, I see your hand up, but I think Tim has a response to Charles perhaps. So let me hand it to Tim real quick. 
Yeah, thanks, Lisa. I just wanted to let you know, that's a great question and something we are thinking about. And we are actually studying multi-dwelling unit um, programs and, and project possibilities so that we can get to understand how to promote uh, charging stations at you know multifamily dwellings, because that market is going to be up and running, especially as electric vehicles, uh, the, the whole um, electric vehicle progress uh, begins and, and they become up, they come up for leasing options and, and they're more affordable. Certainly everybody or a lot more folks from every economic level are going to be able to participate and we want to make our community ready. So that's actually something we are looking at currently. That's part of the monitoring, although the monitoring, as Lisa mentioned, the monitoring for our own installations for the city um, is around what, exactly what Lisa said. We're, we're really looking at how this whole thing is gonna roll out because there are a lot of private EV stations and EV companies and EV station companies and also retail stores. And a lot of folks are putting them in and we don't wanna start putting in stations and competing commercially and putting them in at places that it's inappropriate. Uh, so that's, that's really the basis of our monitoring is we want to see how this it really rolls out commercially for available charging. We want to keep up with the amount of electric vehicles, but we don't want to be in some kind of competitive situation with uh, other vendors or put them in places where they won't be utilized. Thanks, Tim. And I do Fantastic. want to, Thank you. Um, yeah, just clarify two things real, really quickly that the recommendation was very specific in installing 20 charging stations in the downtown area. So, so it was very specific and that's part of what staff said to monitor over time of does that specific approach and that specific location make sense? Um, but Tim's, Tim's point is, is, is great in terms of our overall approach. And then second, just a reminder, if you could physically raise your hand instead of raise the icon because the icon doesn't get captured on our recording. That'd be great. Um, Mary Lynn. Thanks. Hi, um, my question is actually uh, follows on Charles. He beat me to the question on stranded assets and perhaps is a question that uh, um, Tim Ellis could, um, could respond to. I um, have been learning more and more about microgrids and uh, have been reading about the Holy Cross microgrid in Aspen, which um, I think a couple of the people who called in mentioned this. It's been um, touted in IEEE Spectrum and PC Magazine as the future of sustainable power. And I know you've been doing some um, experiments to this effect in the city. I think Polly was behind getting this started or promoting it. And Tim, you've been working on that. I would like to see that um, focused on um, and addressed, you know, um, um, uh, as sort of fronted as being a um, possible solution and learn more about what's being done in that regard. And I also do wanna bring up the issue of the HEMS since they capture the same information as a, um, a smart meter, but it's customer facing, um, why do we need the redundancy of a smart meter? I, I guess what I should be saying is, um, I don't think we do need it if we're going to be going towards microgrids. So that's my comment. I can address the first part of that initially. I mean, as, as far as the, the project up in Holy Cross, uh, we are certainly interested in, in, that, in that project. In fact, we met with Holy Cross last year to discuss that project specifically. And we tried to bring some of those elements into our Habitat for Humanity um, project that we are still working on, on starting up. We're just waiting for some of the homes to be constructed still. Uh, before we run into full implementation, but those are that program is definitely something we're interested in, and the multiple components um, in a, you know in an economically affordable way, uh, we certainly want to include all of those uh, when we can. So that our startup with that understanding is this habitat project. You know we're looking at other home solutions, so smart thermostats and batteries and that type of thing as well. So certainly that is a, a strategy we're looking very heavily into. We, are, we actually, as part of that project, we are installing uh, HEMS in those homes. Um, the only comment I would make is the HEMS are, as you said, they're a, a home, a customer facing informational piece. Of, um, and I don't think that's compatible with utility billing, but I won't talk about the, the AMI and, and all that because that's not my expertise, but I know the HEMS are great 
for a homeowner to get exact to because some the new hem technology is interesting because it it disaggregates loads in its own algorithms and gives a customer an idea of um, a homeowner idea of how they what where their energy breakdown is and if they can make any improvements. But it really is for a homeowner's use specifically, at least the ones I've been looking into. Okay, but well, it is part of the Habitat project. Well, they're, they're homeowner's use, but also on a microgrid. And in a microgrid, if it's balancing its own loads, then the only data that needs to be exported is the billing data, is the way that I understand it. Um, and uh, since the costs of renewables are plummeting so much, um, the smart meters really seem like um, overkill. There's no need to gather that um, that extreme amount of data when the people who really need it are the members of a microgrid, the homeowners and the businesses that are within the microgrid. That's my understanding and that's my concern looking at this. Thanks, Marilyn. Um, Polly, I saw your hand up and then was there somebody else? Okay, Polly. Uh, yeah, I, I think it would be useful. I, I really do think we need to talk to Platte River Power Authority. And um, <clears throat> but I think it's useful for people to know that they, their policy is managed by each of the five, uh, I believe it's five members uh, of this um, cooperative are uh, represented by the mayor of each city and only the mayor can come and the head of the public utility. So um, it would also, and we have never in the last six years gotten a single report on what goes on at one month <laughs> utility from, <clears throat> from uh, those two entities that go up there. So um, it might be useful to have either the mayor or David Hornbacher come speak about uh, what goes on there because they set the policy. And I, I was stunned to see that we're still operating on 42% coal. So electrification, which if you look at some of the other things causes uh, something like 35% of the emissions. Um, if, we continue, if we're gonna increase electrification while continuing to use coal, that's kind of wacky. Um, but of course it has to be a balance of reducing one while you're increasing the other because otherwise you have no redundancy and it, uh, you can't just cut off the call overnight. <laughs> but um, yeah, I would suggest that we have David Hornbacher come and speak about how the policy is being set at um, uh, Platte River Power Authority. Thanks. Thanks, Polly. Adam. Just really quickly, I'd like to express my support for learning more about the Platte River Power Authority policy. Great. Um, any other feedback? I, I just want to quickly clarify. Um, after having watched the three hour, um, attended the on, three hour online um, annual meeting from Platte River, it's very clear to me that um, we need to bring in professional strategic planning um, or they need to bring in professional strategic planning um, uh, consultants. Um, they, the number of, of uh, questions and responses to questions that amounted to, we do need short range planning. We don't need short range planning. The next board will do short range planning. We trust that the current staff will do. And then they did the same thing about long range planning it was very concerning to me. And I would like to focus our questions around um, having a, uh, a professionally led strategic planning process that uh, accurately identifies and receives input from stakeholders and builds uh, uh, projects that are um, appropriately in response to the stakeholders' needs and concerns. Thanks, Marilyn. Yeah, Annie. Um, I, I don't mean to cut anybody off. I just want to do a time check because um, I know we have a pretty long agenda and I think we're just on 7A, is that right? The sustainability yep. report? Yep. Yep. So, um, and I think this is a great conversation. I think there's a lot of great things and it, it sounds like our intention is to bring PRPA back and have that conversation, so. Yep. Yeah, are there any other final comments? I'll have Francie um, bring up that memo document again and we can read through and if people are good or if they wanna add anything. 
Um, okay. Here we go. You all want to read through that real quick and let me know if, if that all sounds okay. Jim. I don't think it's necessary for this version because like we are just a few months in, but I think in the future versions, it would be very handy if the kind of like, uh, like goal and where we actually are was, uh, was kind of like um, graphically shown a little bit more like, oh, we're, you know, I mean, you know, I'm envisioning dumb things like we had in school, but I think, I don't think it's necessary for this one and I don't want it included on this, but I think in the future, as, especially as we're getting more uh, uh, there, it'd be, it'd be great to have something that's just a graphical representation of, of how, how close we are to our goal. Like infographic kind of style. Yep. Yeah, that was my hope with this, but um, I ran into some timeline issues. So I'll look to include that later. Yeah, Mary Lynn. I would like to see a statement about professional strategic planning um, with, um, with a very robust a program of gathering stakeholder input. For Platte River? Yeah. Or for our energy planning. Yeah. It might, yeah. Well, Francie's typing that out, are there any other comments? Do people feel good with sending this along with council, with the report to council? So, so um, I wonder if because this is a, a progress report, um, we might make some comment that in several of the areas or many of the areas that we, um, you know, applaud or um, praise the hard work and and uh, reasonable progress that's being made in those areas. It, you know, we still leave it because there's so many different areas and some of these things were are um, not being worked on currently or we're not as happy with maybe just it just seems like because it's a progress report we should mention something about the progress <laughs> <laughs> great thanks charles yeah jim I'd, I'd second that i think that's a great idea charles and i especially considering i mean i don't think we necessarily need to say that but i uh, i think that's a a great idea and i i, I support that great thanks francie did you catch that all i heard was something about progress because i was typing something else <laughs> You're doing a good job. <laughs> so is it happy about current progress? Yeah, Charles just said that um, just to capture that the, the board is is pleased with the progress that um, staff has made on yeah. overall. Ple yeah, ple yeah, pleased with the, um, you know, the, the, the effort and the progress that the staff have made um, on um, the action items or areas of the climate action plan. Um, yeah. And, and Francine, not to be nitpicky, but if you could just say uh, professionally led rather than extensive strategic planning, I'd rather have an efficient short strategic planning than an extensive one. <laughs> All right, great. Well, we'll send that off uh, with the report to council. I will send you all the final report um, as well as the council communication that will go to city council. Oh, Charles, did you have something to add? Yeah, one last little quick thing. Yep. Could we could we move our our bullet point about being pleased with the progress to the to be the first bullet point? I know that's <laughs> a minor <laughs> nick, the key thing. I like it first, maybe. Th thanks, or, or 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 early. There you that's go. That's nice. I like Perfect. that. I like it. Thank you. All right. Thanks. Excellent. Well, thank you all for your for your feedback. I'm excited about the new format. I hope next time it will go a little more smoothly. And I'm going to pass it over to Susan Bartlett to give you an update on the electrification plan. And we do, as Annie mentioned, have a number of things still on the, the agenda. So um, as a reminder to let Susan kind of get through her presentation and try to keep questions pretty brief so we can um, get through everything. Thank you. All right. Thanks, Lisa. Well, again, um, afternoon. I'm Susan Bartlett. I'm a key account manager with Longmont Power and Communications. And this is an ideal opportunity for me to let you know where we are on climate action recommendation 
BE2, which is electrification. There's already been a lot of discussion about that. So I'm kind of excited to hear what you have to say and be incorporating that into our activities. Next slide. So I, I want to just briefly update you on electrification. It's, as you know, it's one of the many climate action recommendations that was approved by City Council that Lisa has gone through. Um, specifically, this recommendation has to do with reducing carbon and greenhouse gas emissions from buildings while keeping housing affordable for our most vulnerable community members. And I want to share where where we are right now i want to talk about the purpose and the makeup of the electrification feasibility committee I want to share a tentative schedule for convening the phased electrification plan and then just talk next steps um, next slide heather so as a reminder this recommendation includes convening that feasibility committee to oversee the planning efforts, um, conducting appropriate research that becomes necessary as we move through the process, vetting policy and program options with community priorities that have been identified in other work like the sustainability planning and the just transition um, planning, considering impacts to housing stock, and then developing and viable building electrification plan that we can phase in over the next few years. And um, you all have already identified some of the challenges ahead in terms of thinking about electrification and how that relates to our fuel mix. So it's a it's a, a meaty topic, if you will. And I just want to let you know that our work is underway already. And our progress to date includes completing the work plan that uh, was in your packet, working with Fort Collins Utilities and a consultant to conduct some early heat pump and HVAC market research in our area. Also identifying some key staff members that are going to support the effort and then developing a scope of work in RFP to solicit a consultant to help with facilitation, a community strategy and also some plan development. And um, so I want to highlight the feasibility committee's role today and then let you know a little bit about rec recruitment. You can go to the next slide, Heather. So the committee's primary role is to oversee the planning process um, that's going to be conducted by staff with consulting support we hope to have a committee that is um, has representation from sectors that could be most affected by strategies or policies that uh, evolve as part of the plan. For example, um, development and new construction, the trades, affordable housing, property management, the rental community. Uh, we're also going to include some community members at large. We're also going to include key city staff from built and planning from Longmont Power and Communications, from sustainability, and also from um, the housing authority. We're going to have two city council committee liaisons. Uh, Polly mentioned these earlier. So Marsh Martin and Joe Joan Peck were selected at last night's council meeting and they're on board to help support this work. And we expect committee membership to be about two years. And that includes kind of getting us through the planning process and also getting us underway with kind of launching activities related to the plan. Next slide. So our current timetable is to post the RFP for consultant support this month, select committee members by May, and we would like to have that committee underway in June. Um, the work plan outlines some ten the, the tentative committee meetings to be about every six to eight weeks as needed during this time frame. Of course, it's flexible and will adjust as needed depending on the work at hand. Um, we also anticipate developing a communication strategy early in the process so that we can share and gather information effectively as we go. And uh, we're also going to be including an engaged Longmont page that uh, will be available soon. As I mentioned, we've already got this local market research underway to help inform committee work. Next slide. So we've already got the first thing done with our council committee liaisons selected. Next, we're going to work on our sector specific committee members and getting them on board. We're going to post an at large application for two member slots and uh, we don't have that ready to post yet. It won't take us long. We wanted to um, 
get through the council meeting last night and make sure there weren't any changes that we needed to make to the work plan. And uh, once we know when that's going to be posted, staff will keep you apprised of the timing on the application in case you're interested or if you know of others who might want to apply and participate and help us out in this way. And like I said, we hope to have the consultants selected by the end of May so that we can get the committee underway in June. And throughout this process, we want to keep this board and city city council just apprised of progress. And um, Lisa, through her efforts to keep you updated on all of the climate action activities, um, will be including information there. And uh, next slide. Any questions? Yeah, Adam. Adam. Yeah, thanks a lot for the overview. Regarding the committee, is it tasked with focusing on electrification or will it consider broader topics like energy efficiency and also considering how to make buildings interact with the grid? I'm glad you said the energy efficiency part. I always want to talk about efficiency, but it's boring and I find that not many other people want to talk about it very much. So, um, so yes. Energy efficiency to me is a key component of um, moving towards electrification and um, that that to me needs to be part of our work. And you had a second question. I got all excited about energy efficiency and I don't remember what the second question was. I think I was just citing examples like having the buildings also interact with the grids. Um, I could come up with more like maybe making homes more passive, replacing like conventional HVAC units with heat pumps and uh, swamp coolers, like things like that, that um, would help reduce the carbon footprint as well as the affordability of buildings. Right. So we will be kind of gathering in ideas and those against kind of what the priorities of the community are. Uh, we certainly don't want to um, create strategies that only people can participate in. Uh, we want to be mindful of making things affordable and bringing everyone along as we electrify. We also want to keep in mind, you know, our, our current resource mix and how to balance that um, with what we're doing with electrification technologies. So to me, this first, um, the first activities of the committee will be uh, exploratory and we'll have to kind of shore, shore those exploratory explorations up with additional information and research that will help us kind of make some um, make some decisions around priorities and what are the criteria that we think uh, create the most effective solutions for Longmont. Um, Charles. Yeah, can I ask a question? So, so this is, um, I'm wondering about the relationship with whoever decides on building codes um, will we have real influence on them? Because much of, you know, I, I see new construction all over the place and it's really disappointing to see how we're using technologies that are literally 200 years old <laughs> that uh, could be replaced with much more efficient and climate friendly technologies. And, and I think a part of it is just, we, we, um, uh, the, some of the building codes are, um, maybe too friendly towards, uh, old, old, um, inefficient polluting technologies? I, I think it's a good question, Charles. And as Lisa kind of reviewed earlier in her presentation, you know, building codes is one of the things that's um, part of the effort at hand. We want to collaborate with that review process as they take a look at the new IECC codes coming up and how to how to incorporate those into our own city codes and what do we want to encourage that we think will um, that will well it will encourage better buildings in our community over time so so those are things that are happening kind of simultaneously and we're again we're going to have to balance our work with their work and making make sure that we're collaborating but yes you're you're right there's the the new construction is a huge opportunity for electrification yeah you think of those as 100 year assets and um you know they're going to be in place for you know 100 years and if they're using technologies that are not you know if in, in 2030 if we want to be um, you know, carbon free, for example, but our houses are being built uh, that aren't <laughs> built to be carbon free, uh, it can be very difficult. So um, that'd be great if we have real influence on 
on how our building codes are uh, modernized. Well, and, and just to reiterate too, we'll have representation from the planning and building departments on the committee. So, you know, we want to stay plugged in with what they're doing and we want to be able to have them hear and participate in uh, the things that we're exploring as well. So I hope to have some really good uh, cross pollination there, if you will. Per perfect. Thank you. Mary Lynn. Um, yeah, I think that um, this begs the uh, question of um, when it comes to sustainability, when you have to really um, start looking at things like building codes um, from a multivariate ap approach from the outset where there's a representative who's talking about the electrification issue, but then there's also uh, folks who can represent um, the other better use of resources like bringing in geothermal, having passive solar, having neighborhoods where the homes are oriented in a certain way as they're doing in um, building whole cities in India now so that um, the house can um, heat and cool itself by the way that um, it's oriented, um, bringing in all the technologies like um, hempcrete. And it seems to me that this is a discussion that needs to be um, happen in a convening that's not just in a board that's talking about the electrification and giving feedback on this. It needs to be a specific convening to talk about a perhaps innovative building, building codes in the context of innovating, um, innovative urban planning towards sustainability. And I, maybe I should just ask um, Polly what you think about that, <laughs> where that would happen. I think the, uh, I know we're limited here in time, but <laughs> so I'll try to be brief, but I, I really do think that all this is based upon the idea that people who are building these buildings are building them for the good of humanity. <clears throat> and actually what they're doing is building buildings that they will declare distressed in 30 years or less than 50 years. We are re rebuilding and rebuilding and rebuilding things over and over again and wasting materials. It doesn't matter how good the electrical system is if we are not building them to last in the first place and we're not reusing any of that construction material. It's all being landfilled. We are not building buildings in the first place um, that are meant to be meant to last for 500 years. My uncle lived in a building that was 500 years old. I, I, you know, it's, it's a larger problem. However, we'll do what we can, but we do need to talk about the sustainability of the whole building process. When we're building things that are not using very good insulation. And uh, we also, also see a problem with an envelope that's too tight then you're not getting any fresh air in at all. And it actually takes more energy to keep the air moving and clean when you actually, well, you know, it's complicated. <laughs> but I, I do think that uh, it's worth exploring with planning and zoning. And uh, certainly what we're focusing now is on electrification. So that's what we'll focus on. But I think it's part of a whole larger problem having to do with um, the way we think about our buildings. We can modify our buildings, we can modify our houses instead of having them be our homes and being able to pass them out down to our children. It's a bigger problem. <laughs> Jim, did you have something to add? Yeah, um, I was just curious. I mean, I, I agree, new building codes for new buildings you know, there's, there's a lot of room there, but it seems like even with one month's population growth projected into the future, um, more than half of people who live in Longmont are going to be living in buildings that are already here. And it seems that that uh, making and I, and I know that like the the plan that we have for achieving all of these things is very holistic, and there's a million parts, and they all interact with each other. Um, and I'm I'm not telling anybody anything that they don't know already. <laughs> But it seems like um, that uh, making sure that 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 making sure that we can, you know, take our, in my case, not very well built house in, from 1984 and make it a lot more efficient is going to do, probably bang for the buck. Be 
um, be give us a, a lot more of a of a leap in terms of a f overall energy efficiency, um, and in in that case you would have invested homeowners who would see it as as something that homeowners or property owners who would see it as adding value to their to their you know what what they own as opposed to trying to convince somebody who's who's throwing up a condo complex. Um, to do something that is just going to cost them money and, and won't make them money. I just, I, I hope that the balance there is, I, I, I agree, new construction, we need to, that needs to be a topic. I'm not saying it's not, but it seems that, that um, we could gain a lot by making sure that we have, we have um, uh, programs that are helping people with all their, you know, moderately built houses uh, really take advantage of the energy efficiency leaps that they could make and, and also kind of give them like make their investment worth more. Yeah, I, I think you make a good point. We have a spectrum of buildings to work with, those that haven't been built yet and those that we're living in and working in today. And there are different motivating factors in both of those sectors. And, um, you know, in some, in some, in one sector, we may have more um, leverage compulsory leverage, if you will, related to codes. In, in the existing building sector, we need to rely on other motivating factors. And that's when economics comes into play and, you know, other, other, um, other factors that motivate people to do what they do. And, um, you know, we have, we have homeowners and we have property owners and we have people who rent. And, you know, how do we make sure that, um, the most people have the most access to what's going to make our community better and, um, you know, maintain affordability. So um, if there was a secret recipe that we could follow, I would be all over it. I think it's going to be really challenging. And so we want to have, we want to have good and uh, passionate people at the table to help us. We want to reach out for expertise when we need it and uh, hopefully leverage that to make some good phased decisions for the community. Because I, I don't know if it was Mary Lynn or Polly, you know, we can't, we can't do it all at once. We can't shut the coal plants down all at once. We have to do this in a, in a stepwise and, and thoughtful way. And um, so for me anyway, that sort of figuring out what the next first best thing is to do and moving from there. Yeah. I, yeah. I, I think that the city has a record of doing this. I feel that everybody who's involved in this project does this already, and I don't want to sound condescending about it. So I, I oh, agree. no, understood. I, no, it, it's yeah. a good point. Balance is hard. <laughs> okay, thank you for the presentation. And in, in the interest of time, we need to move on uh, thank you. the agenda. Uh, but really appreciate that, Susan. Thanks. Um, Francie, uh, it looks like you're up next with a transportation roadmap update. Great, thank you, Chair. So uh, as this is a return item, um, we presented the transportation roadmap at our last, at your last meeting. We sent um, responses to questions over email. We worked to integrate feedback. So instead of walking through, which was in the updated version that was sent out with the packet. So we're not going to walk through a presentation again. Uh, the one item, since Phil is here today, so he's going to quickly talk a little bit about Transportation Planning 101, which we think will further answer some of the questions. But then right after that, um, we will go straight to the vote. So again, as a reminder, the vote is recommend it go to City Council as is, recommend with some edits, or do not go to City Council at this time. The Roadmap is on the agenda for the April 6th City Council meeting. So I'll hand it over to Phil. Great, thank you, Francie, appreciate it. Uh, my name is Phil Greenwald, Transportation Planning Manager with the City of Longmont and Chair and members of board, thanks for having me today. And, and I'll try to explain very quickly of the uh, transportation funding. And I think that's was your question is more about the funding piece than just transportation planning. Um, but the funding piece is very, uh, it really starts at the local level, quite frankly, and that's our three quarter cent sales tax that we have on all on all goods and items uh, with within a certain range. Um, but we we do charge that sales tax at a local level. That gives us a lot of uh, leverage, actually, when we go out to state and federal 
levels so that we can also get uh, or access those different grants. And I think Lisa told you a little bit about uh, some of the grants that we were able to get um, through, uh, through her group that uh, really helps us with the, uh, with the grant writing piece of that. Before we were kind of doing it on our, on our own and that's a, that's a tough one. So we really appreciate the help on that one. But again, that three quarter cent sales tax you know, gains us about $10 million a year uh, for our streets program. Um, and that's beyond, that's just the money that kind of goes into pro new projects. There's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a additional money that goes into just trying to maintain our existing system. So um, I don't want to get too far and too deep into it, but, uh, and I really appreciate the idea that Francie had sent out some of your questions to us and we were able to respond. And I hope we were able to do that in a, in a, in a reasonable and, and uh, efficient and, uh, and hopefully we got all the information back to you that you needed on that. So um, I think what we really like to do is just move on to the vote if we can. And if you have any questions, please let me know. But uh, really simplistic view again of what we do uh, at the funding levels for transportation. And, and we could go further into what we do for planning. But I think what you see in the, in, in the equitable uh, carbon-free transportation roadmap that was presented last month is that we've really taken the equitable, the carbon-free pieces of those plans and all the different things that we try to do with our funds. And we've, we try to consolidate them down into what we do or into this roadmap piece. So that it gives us a clearer picture of how we move forward and how we do that in a phased manner as well. So uh, with that, I will turn it back over to Francie and um, hopefully that uh, helps with any questions you might have. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, Kate, would you like to lead the, the vote process at this time or would like me to restate the different options? Yeah, so the, let me try to restate them and you can correct me if I get them wrong. <laughs> um, so the, the options are to, to present to council as is, to present to council with modifications, which we would then also provide, or what's the third one? Is that it? To not pre present. To, to not present to council, okay. Um, hmm. How uh, the, does anybody um, how about this? Does anybody not want to present this to council? Okay. Are are how and now are we good as is? Is anybody yes? That would anybody like to motion that, I will, <laughs> that we present it as is? I will move to present the transportation roadmap as is to city council. Okay. Is there a second? I'll, I'll second that. Okay. Motion. <laughs> all, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. That looks like unanimous approval. So please present as is. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And thank you for your hard work. <laughs> yes. Yes. Okay. Um, Lisa, it looks like you're going to lead us in the next vote. Um, yeah, actually, I, I can hand that off to you all. So um, just as a reminder that you all have the presentation from um, Jenny Black, who's on the call today around the, um, I don't remember what the acronym is, but the, the CCL Carbon Dividend <laughs> Act. Um, and she, there, you all had sent her some questions that she responded to you. So Kate, I'll just probably just hand it back to you to, to call a vote on whether or not you all want to bring that resolution um, to council. Yeah, or, or support bringing a resolution to council. Yeah, Adam. Okay. Uh, Adam? Yeah, I was just gonna say, Kate, I'm just gonna remind everyone that I do volunteer for a citizen's climate lobby. And so I'll recuse myself from this vote. Thanks for that reminder, Adam. Okay. Uh, is anybody w uh, willing to make that motion to uh, to approve, well, to send this to council with our endorsement? Uh, I mean, I will. I, I, I move to send this to council with our endorsement. I'm glad that I had an extra month to think about it and answer questions, and uh, I support it and uh, would move to send it to council with our recommendation and blessing and whatever else. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I am going to say I've got a hard pass on this one. Me so. too. 
really hard pass. Really hard pass. All right. Yeah. Uh, so that looks like it's it's down to, to three of us <laughs> here. And with that being the case, are are we are we able to to pass this, Heather? Hey, did we have a second? We don't or have just a, a motion. Okay. Just Before a motion. you would be able to vote on it, we would need a second. But if if majority does vote, it would still pass. Okay. But we don't we won't have it'll just be a 50 50. Because mm -hmm. Adam's not we've got two uh, Adam's oh, two to two, huh? I was yeah. thinking it'd be three to two. No, well, it's it would... three to two. I'm, I mean, uh, Charles and and it's, uh, it's and down to Charles and you. <laughs> but someone has to second it first. Yeah. So with with Adam abstaining, there would be five members. So either way, it could pass okay. or fail. Okay. Cool. All right. Charles, are you willing to second? <laughs> uh, interesting. Yeah, I've I've been thinking about this and. Um, I think if the prices of wind and solar weren't dropping so fast, this would be a fantastic tool and very necessary. Um, but I think that free market forces are probably going to make it unnecessary given the adoption curves that we're seeing and the price reduction curves. I, um, I'm still willing to support it. Um, I just don't think it's really necessary. <laughs> Yes. Okay. So, are you so seconding will, the motion? <laughs> I will. I will second the motion. Okay. <laughs> Not with a ton of enthusiasm. <laughs> Noted. Okay. Um, so, those of us in favor. Um, Aye. Looks like three of us. Okay. And to uh, those opposed, please raise your hands. Got it. Maybe. Thank you. And one abstained. All right. Do we need? Are we? Are we good there, Heather? We're good. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Is when we forward things to council, is the vote forwarded along with the overall recommendation? Yeah, we can include that. I think, I think that'd certain. be good. Yeah. yeah I agree. <laughs> Yep. So make sure you document me as a no, as a publicly no. <laughs> usually, usually when we forward these things from other boards, what we do is include in uh, an excerpt of the minutes in the um, memo. So we could do that this time as well. So then I would like to um, put in a comment that um, I believe others in the board um, made last time as well. I'm very concerned about um, the onerous nature of this additional tax on um, the small and the specialized um, business. I'm in general concern for the in general economy. So <laughs> we'll add those notes to the minutes. Thank you. Thank Thanks. you. Thank you. OK, um, the next item on the agenda is uh, a, from Tim Ellis, Electric Vehicle Charging Stations uh, Rate and Review or and rate review, sorry. Hey. Floor is yours. Do you have the presentation ready? Or am I gonna pull it up? Uh, give me just one moment. Sure. Um, and one clarification I'd like to make right off the bat. First of all, thank you, board, to, for having me come and present on this material, trying to give a, a summary about our city-owned um, EV stations, as well as um, there's a, I put a misterm on there. It's not really a rate analysis. The rate has other implications for the utility, which are not a good idea to put on this uh, or a term as what we're, we're um, proposing here. It's really a service fee analysis because uh, for these for the stations that we own, we previously did have a service fee, and uh, we are looking now. Um, we analyzed what the costs are and and wanted to re-implement that fee. And I'll I'll go into more detail at the end, but just want to make that clarification right up front. Um, so as as Lisa mentioned earlier, and you know a bunch of the topics talked about transportation. I was happy to hear some early questions. Um, which are actually part of this presentation about EV charging stations and our strategy to roll them out. But, but this presentation is really to 
give a summary on, on what happened last year at our stations. Um, this, the stations and EVs are obviously an important part of our overall transportation plans. Uh, this is for sustainability, we're looking to reduce emissions and EVs play a big role in that. Um, for the climate action plan, it also reduces greenhouse, greenhouse gases and, and also um, hopefully will play an important role as we look into the, the carbon-free equitable transition uh, transportation plan in the future. So it really touches on all of those areas. Next slide, please. The city of uh, Longmont currently owns five public charging stations. They're mapped out here. <clears throat> They're all manufactured by ChargePoint and they all have, they each have two ports. So two ports, two cars can charge at the same time. So there's 10 available ports total. Um, we installed these um, charge point stations in 2019 as replacement stations. Um, and the last one was installed uh, at the library last year. <clears throat> and this map obviously shows where these are. There's one at the Memorial Building, uh, DSC parking lot between Maine and Kimbark. Um, there's one over at the library now and one at the museum and at the LPC Service Center. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, this chart shows how much, um, how many kilowatt hours were consumed in 2020 at all five stations. And we could see that there's, there's over 43,000 kilowatt hours used to charge electric vehicles last year. Uh, you can see there was a, a distinct drop off in April, you know, with the onset of, of COVID, but stations are you know, recovering and have recovered to the, to the most, for the most part um, from that drop off. And obviously we'll have more data for the beginning months of this year to see how that's going. Next slide, please. Um, this chart shows the charge point calculation for greenhouse gas emission reductions. There's several variables that go into this and just wanna note up front that LPC is working with sustainability to get um, more clarification and calculations around Longmont specific emission reductions uh, for vehicles that uh, go from gas to electric in, in our territory specifically. But this shows that there were over 17 metric tons of carbon dioxide reductions as a result of charging versus driving on, on standard gasoline with standard, standard gasoline cars. Next slide, please. And this is a quick graphic, uh, shows a couple of the benefits uh, right off the bat for a standard electric vehicle versus standard gas vehicle. Uh, for each gallon that you would pay for in a standard gas vehicle, you would get for the same amount of money, you get over 90 extra miles of driving for that, for that gallon cost. Um, also in the year where a, car, a vehicle drives over 12,000 miles, there's over um, $1,000 of savings in, in the purchase price of, of gasoline, uh, uh, electricity versus gasoline. So there's a lot of savings around, um, around the electric vehicles that are, you know, even though they're, they cost more up front down the line, there's significant savings for those owners. Next slide, please. Um, this slide shows the number of sessions. Um, a session is defined as each time a car plugs in. Uh, so we see that there's, there's about 3,800 sessions in 2020 for all five stations. And we found that the average charging time per car was, was three to four hours, although there were some quicker ones and, and some that were plugged in longer, but the average time was three to four hours. Next slide, please. And this pie chart shows a breakdown by station, stations of how many unique drivers um, were at each station. Uh, it's important to note that the library there in dark blue uh, that was installed um, and operational in late September of 2020. So it had a lot less unique drivers and we're expecting more this year, but you can clearly see that the um, Memorial and DSC had, uh, had a substantial amount of, of unique drivers. Uh, we did a calculation on unique drivers for all stations. Uh, even if one unique driver used multiple stations, we counted them as one. And we, we found that there were 342 different people um, that were charging at, that charged at our stations in 2020. So there were multiple charges by folks. Uh, if you look at the sessions versus the, the unique drivers. Next slide, please. And here's a table of the metrics showing, the, um, showing our, what analysis we, we considered when we were looking at what the costs were and how we would recoup funds uh, through a service fee. 
Um, <clears throat> the available hours is simply the available, the hours that the, that port, a particular port was available or a station was available for the year. So you can see, you know, um, there's 8760 hours in a year. So the service center station was available all year. So there was a total of 17,520 hours of availability. So that's all night, 24 hours a day. Um, the charging time shows how long a, a vehicle or vehicles were plugged in and charging during the year for each station. Uh, the time at the station um, indicates how long the vehicles were plugged in and um, either charging or not. We wanted to take a look at that and see what the percentage is around how long folks were charging and if they sat there with their cars plugged in after they were done charging. Uh, so it would, it would hinder others availability to charge at those stations. Um, so the time charging versus available hours, pretty wide range here. Um, so you could see the Memorial DSC, that's a really high rate of charging considering that we're considering 24 hours a day. Um, so that this 20%, 16%, that's total time of the entire year that, that, that folks were charging at those stations, pretty high. The library, um, it does have a gate that closes at night and also it just opened in September. So we're expecting higher um, usability at that one over 2021 and in the future. And that last column charging while plugged in is just looking at the time at station versus charging time to see that, um, try to get an understanding if, if cars were sitting there plugged in and not charging. Um, and we found they're, they're pretty high percentages of charging time. So, so people tended to move their vehicles after they were done charging within, within an hour or two. Uh, so that was good to see. And that's something we keep our eye on because if, if cars are, are sitting at those stations a long time after they're done charging, you know, we'll implement uh, the, the, the service charge is gonna be, as I'll cover, charging them for every time, all the time they're plugged in. So even if they're not charging, they're getting charged uh, a fee. So that will hopefully motivate uh, people to, to move their cars after they're done. Let's see, next slide, please. And here are the results. Uh, again, it's not a rate analysis, it's service fee analysis. Uh, the, the metrics we use to calculate this fee were the cost of electricity um, to charge the vehicles. Um, average hours of charging uh, that you know we had last year data. So that um, is a number that we, we needed to understand to in order to recoup the costs. Uh, we put in the purchase and installation costs of the station as well as uh, maintenance repair contracts, which we have at all five stations. We have five year maintenance and repair contracts. Um, any wiring and metering that needed to be done um, to get those uh, stations up and ready to install and also administrative fees just to, to keep an eye and, and do analyses and, and keep on top of the stations, make sure they're repaired and operable. Um, off of that total cost, we took the rebate that we received from the state of Colorado um, grant that, that we get, which is very substantial, which is for a public station, we get up to $9,000 per station. And um, so we got a lot of money back. So that went into that cost fee calculation as well. And we determined that to, in order to have a self-sustaining fee to have EV stations, uh, $1 an hour was sufficient at this time um, as a charge, which is exactly what we charged before. Uh, we changed those stations out and stopped charging for um, a year or two. Um, and, then, and then our nearby cities, Fort Collins, uh, Boulder and Loveland, uh, all charge a uh, dollar an hour as well. So there's consistency throughout the region. If people are traveling through the, the uh, front range, they're gonna understand how to charge and what the fees mean because since they're all pretty consistent. Um, next slide, please. And uh, so yeah, so Charles, this is the, what you were talking about, this cost curve, pretty steep. Um, this is from the Colorado and EV plan, this graphic, and it shows a business as usual. Uh, they have three lines in here, a high, um, their study, what the study shows, if they implement certain uh, policies, and then a business as usual uh, scenario, but all of them are, have a pretty steep trajectory for expected EVs in Colorado over the next 10 years. So that's something when we say we're monitoring station um, installations and you know the purchase of EVs, these are the numbers we're keeping an eye on so that we can keep up with our support of electrical, electric vehicle integration into our city. 
Um, and the Rocky Mountain Institute is, is an interesting comment that if all the light duty vehicles in the US uh, roads today increase, would increase the, if all of them were electric, it increased electricity demand by 25%. So that's something we also talked about earlier is with electrification and of both buildings and with transportation, we're going to see an increase of electric demand and we have to be ready to accommodate that with uh, renewable energy and, and just being able to have reliable energy on the grid with variable sources of generation. Um, so EVs are gonna play a big part into increasing the electric demand and uh, we're certainly um, planning on, on being able to, to uh, keep up our reliability and, and uh, support the electrical, electric vehicle transition in our, in our community. I think that's it for me. Oh, well, sorry, next steps. <laughs> uh, so we're that this, um, the council presentation was pushed back a couple of weeks. Now we're presenting on April 13th. Uh, we're gonna present this information to council. Um, after that, we're planning on educating the community, community about that rate, um, not rate, uh, service fee uh, implementation in the springtime. And we're looking to implement that service fee sometime this summer, June, or after, depending on, on, how, on how we message that out to the community. Um, and that, that's our plan. Hey, thank you. Uh, yeah, Charles. And then Adam. Sorry. I'm sorry, jumping out of turn. Uh, two, quick, one quick question. You didn't mention what the power was of the chargers. So, you know, uh, is it a 150 kilowatt hour uh, charger? Uh, oh, I'm sorry. Yes, all of ours are level two chargers. That's a great point, Charles. I need to put that in my notes for this council presentation. Yeah, we yeah, have all level twos at this point. Um, and that's, uh, they charge at about three point, average of 3.5 kW at a time. Um, so yeah, so they're level twos. Level two. Okay. Got it. And they don't, so they're not shared when, when two cars are plugged into the same charger, they don't reduce the power to each one. Actually right now, that's another great point is our previously we had single chargers out there. So when we replaced them with the dual ports, the power share was put on so that they share the 20 amps if there's two, but if one's there, it's the 40 amps service, but we're actually having our electrician, our, our contractor go out there and rewire that so that everyone will get that 40 amp charge, at least for the full, all those other than the library, because the library had some electric panel constraints where we could not accommodate that, accommodate that. but we are um, going to uh, ramp up those, uh, that power share to a full charge capability. Great. And then real, one real quick thing, um, so just, I, I loved your presentation, it's great. Um, I wonder if you put that exponential adoption curve uh, that you showed towards the end. I wonder if you put that up, you know, early up front might help in your presentation to council. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I can see the urgency on um, what we're trying to do. Right. Thank you, Tim. Yeah. You're welcome. Thanks. Uh, Adam had a question, then Polly. Yeah, same here. I agree with Charles. I really like the presentation. I learned a lot. And I have a question that follows from our earlier discussion on charging stations. And that's how many private sector charging stations are in the city of Longmont? And do you work with uh, those companies to strategically place um, your charging stations? And like, what other uh, sort of collaborations do you have with those uh, uh, groups? Right, <clears throat> that's an excellent question. That's something we're going to have to deal with more right now. Um, what we've seen, there are dozens of other charging stations in the city, but there are most, most of them are at retail stores like the Walmarts and the, the um, um, other large stores that, that want to do this. Sometimes they charge, sometimes they use it as a, you know, a service to their customers. Uh, so that market is so new um, and it's important that we do partner with, or at least have understandings with those um, installers as we move forward, because they're going to have a bigger and bigger impact on our grid. Um, so that's an excellent question and something we are going to have to uh, strategize uh, along with, but there are dozens out there and, um, you know, right, right now the impacts are minimal, but, you know, as you see by the, the penetration, the expected penetration of EVs, it's going to ramp up pretty quick. So that's something we're, we're looking at and we're going to definitely um, be partnering in many ways to, to those entities that are installing. And there, you know, there's not only the retails and the, and the, um, the, um, the stores that are installing these, there's, there's folks making this a commercial business where they, they find places to put stations and they wanna make this 
you know, their business. So we're, we're kind of seeing who's going to do what out there. And um, as they are doing that, they are contacting us because they need to um, actually get a permit for it. So we're, we're aware of these um, installations. And as they are ramping up, we're definitely going to need to partner with those organizations. Yeah, Polly. Okay, so I don't mean to be the sour grape person, but I usually am. <laughs> so I think this is all well and good, but how much does each charging station cost? The stations uh, for <clears throat> the public stations that we've been putting in, they're between eleven and twelve thousand dollars, and an installation is another couple of thousand on top of that. But as I mentioned, the the rebate that we were getting from Colorado is up to nine thousand. So the actual end right. cost to us is a, is a few thousand dollars for purchase and installation of those stations. So it's not overly expensive, um, which is why we can keep it under a, a dollar per hour to charge customers. And, and keep in mind, as more EVs are purchased and more people are using these stations, the available hours will go up. So when we reanalyze mm -hmm. what kind of fee we're gonna charge, that, can, that is probably gonna go down because there'll be more people charging at a dollar per hour, which will bring in the more revenue. So when we reassess that fee, it can, if more folks are using it, that fee will actually be reduced and we'll still recoup our costs. <clears throat> okay, but does that pay for, how often do these have to be replaced? Because we I know the technology, yeah, we built that into our um, our cost um, our costs, and we assumed a ten year lifetime. Um, so okay, they, so you're building that into the cost of maintenance. Maintenance, and then at, at, when there's a need for replacement, that the, that rate will cover a purchase and installation and all the things that were in those metrics. Okay, but so with gas fees, I mean, right now, I guess my my worry is that. Mostly the only people who can afford electric vehicles are the upper middle class and the wealthy. So we're essentially subsidizing them. And to me, that's the essence of inequity. Um, I would rather see this done by private companies. However, are there, they do have to, because we uh, have our own utilities, they have to get a license from us, but are any of these private entities that are doing this um, regulated on the statewide basis? And our end oh, go ahead. Um, I'm not aware of how they're regulated by other by the state. I think they're just regulated by the utility and how they hook up electrically to the grid. Yeah. Um, well, see, right, we have been building our roads and financing all of our transportation system with a gas tax, which is going to disappear. And the city, the people of Colorado do not reject again and again and again, any kind of transportation tax or fee. And we're not charging anything and neither are these private en entities. We need to be charging a transportation fee on this because otherwise we won't be able to build the roads to put the electrical vehicles on or maintain the roads for the electrical vehicles. And although clearly the future is electrical vehicles, but without mass transportation, an equal or greater in investment in mass transportation, we, we will never get our way out of this, particularly because, um, well, I mean, we're growing and growing and growing. And yet we're not putting the money into public mass public transportation, which is what really needs to be happening in order to actually be sustainable. Um, I think that what we're doing is terrific, but um, it's not enough because uh, it's not enough because we're, we're, if this were a good idea, the public, the, the private entities would be getting into this. And I, I think they are, but right now they're not regulated and nobody is, is charging any fees to help us with our transportation problems, which are huge in this state. So uh, I, I, does anybody ever talk about um, 
charging for transportation tax on this? Yeah, that's a, an important point. And actually we presented in front of the transportation board last week and they brought up that same port, point. Oh, it's, it's super important, of course, because yeah. you know anyone who knows anybody, anything about the transportation system in the United States is that the federal government and state government fund the infrastructure. Right. Right? And without yeah. that gas tax, that money goes away. So certainly yeah. that is a really crucial point. And I'm hoping, and I believe that folks at the state are thinking heavily about how to do that. But I think yeah. it's such a new um, it's, the plans are just to start this market up and going. There's such a small penetration yeah. at this point that it's, they're just trying to support the market. And I'm right. sure they'll figure out how to tax all of us once it starts up. So, um, <laughs> Well, and on a national basis, they are talking about it. I talked yeah. to Joe Nagus about that last week, and uh, we are going to be getting some more public uh, some more transportation funding for all kinds of transportation projects, which is what we've needed for the last 50 years. <laughs> so that's, um, that's a good thing. And I, I think this is a good presentation about the issue and about what's going on in town. I, I wish we knew more about uh, all the private entities. And I think that Jim Metcalf brought up a good point in that um, unless we have some of these charging stations at multifamily units, we'll never uh, be able to uh, increase the, and unless we also get more um, subsidies of people being able to buy electrical vehicles, we'll never be able to get really that curve up to where we wanna have it in a fair way. Anyway, well, that's enough for me. Uh, so I've got Mary and, and then Kay, and I just, we have eight minutes left. I uh, just want to have everyone be conscious of that. So Mary? So my question is simply about the timeline and any demand analysis that's been done. Um, we're all assuming that we're moving towards electric vehicles. There's lots of data from lots of different areas. However, how many do we actually, um, stations do we actually need at this time? Um, how do we know that? And I'm just going to throw it out there. Um, would, rather than putting these in, would our money be better spent um, doing as Polly has suggested and uh, recruiting uh, private entities to uh, put in charging stations and to make sure they're on Google Maps so that uh, when people are driving through town, they, um, they know that they're going to have to maybe drive out 119 closer to the highway to, um, to charge up, um, you, know, uh, you know, and just get enough of a charge so that they can you know, keep going or do you know what I'm saying? Yeah, exactly. No, I think that that is an excellent point. I think it goes into what Lisa was discussing before. Initially we said, oh, hey, let's put in 20 stations, but then there's no real um, heavy data to support that, right? So we said, let's, well, let's take a step back. Where the, what's this market going to do? How, who's going to be putting this in? And that's why we don't want to just jump forward and start installing stations when the public, the commercial market may take this over. So that's, I think, what we meant by we're monitoring how this is, is rolling out. Um, Colorado has a huge plan going forward and Excel has a huge plan going forward. So we're kind of a, on a wait and see for now. We're, what we're doing for the city is we are putting in charging stations and buying fleet vehicles, which is a whole nother story, which is great. So we have a city impetus behind our electric vehicle increase. But for the public, it's like, it's kind of like, oh, let's, let's see how this rolls out so we can make smart decisions and have more data to, to back up what we do with installing so stations. So when the city there. could do a market demand analysis to get us through the short term? Who in the city would do that? Um, I, get, I, don't, I don't know. Maybe we can work with sustainability to do that. I'd have to, I'm not going to throw anybody under the <laughs> bus on that one. <laughs> that, um, that's a piece of research that we need before we spend the money. Yeah, I think that's right. We need to know where this market is heading. And, and Colorado, the state has put out some trajectories, but that's statewide. Uh, so regionally, if we get a better understanding, I think that would help guide our strategy. Okay, and then uh, Jim? I'll keep it short and sweet. Everything you guys have been saying, Jim, the you know multifamily housing, Polly, the private industry, Mary, everything you guys are saying, exactly what I'm saying. I just did the short math and at 13%, which is one of the numbers I saw on your slide there, 13% at a dollar per hour over the course of 10 years, that's a, like $11,400. Um, 
So when you look at 3,000 initial cost and a maintenance cost and a land use cost and the real estate taken up by the parking spot, et cetera, et cetera. Yes, just be monitoring it before we're installing anything. And I do think the idea of private industry and Google Maps and getting whatever, you know, the same company does the electric scooters, let them handle it, possibly. Um, you know, I'm going to say I'm pretty far off from being able to afford an electrical vehicle myself. Um, so I'm going to work from home to reduce my emissions. But, <laughs> uh, you know, I, I think it's, a, it's an industry to, it, it's, it's, a, it's something to watch, but not jump into until we are, are really getting there, I want to say. So that's all I've got. All right. Thank you. Uh, Jim? I'll be very quick as well. Um, the multifamily thing wasn't my comment, although I appreciate it. Oh, sorry. Was that smart? <laughs> um, uh, I think uh, I, I think in terms of discussing the market, um, the reason that we are a car culture is because we subsidize the bejesus out of gas cars. And I think that we did that for decades and decades. And um, I think that if we want to make the transition to electric cars, we're also going to have to create it. Um, I, I am in favor of having publicly run, they don't have to all be that way, um, charging stations and helping, uh, helping create the demand. Um, I think that if we wanted to analyze all the ways that we subsidize cars, um, we could, and uh, that for better or for worse, um, it was a lot of public money that, that made our car culture possible. And so I, I'm imagining that we're also going to need a fair amount of, or a modest amounts of public money to also make uh, electric vehicles a lot more affordable and pervasive. I think that's a fair point. <laughs> Thanks. Um, well, we have three minutes left and I don't see any other comments, but thank you, Tim, uh, for that presentation. That was great, uh, very informative. Uh, yes, Charles. I'll throw in one last comment then, <laughs> two, two, two quick ones. One is um, almost all car companies or a, a, a large number of them now have basically said they will not be making gas powered cars after 2030. So um, that's a pretty good indication that uh, we're moving towards electric vehicles. It's gonna take time. I think the next couple of years are gonna be, you know, you'll see them and it's, not, it's gonna take some time. By about three or four years from now, it's gonna explode. Um, and then the final thing is just a real quick note from something earlier. Coal is actually not as cheap as people think and the transition can happen very quickly. The UK went from 60% coal to 10% coal in a matter of five years. And uh, last year they went for two and a half months where they used no coal at all, the months of April, May, and part of June. So <laughs> uh, transitions can happen quickly. Anyway, just a couple quick comments. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, um, we will move on in the agenda to items from the board. Um, anybody have anything? I, I just wanna say that um, some of the resources that I mentioned when we were talking about DERs and home energy management, um, I have put them in an email and I sent it to Heather. And so she's gonna send that to everyone. So you have the resources that I was mentioning. Perfect. Thank you for that, Mary. Um, okay, items from council. Um, Polly, nothing. All right. I've okay. talked enough. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, I will note that there were some uh, items that were attached, uh, board correspondence. Uh, they were attached to the, the packet. There's nothing to do there. Just uh, make sure that you've read them. And um, with that, I, we are at the end of the agenda. Uh, Somebody a minute yes. to spare. What's that? We have a minute to spare. With a minute to spare. I know. Well, let's get this done so we can get out on time. Yes. So oh, should we just yeah. do a couple verses of a college fight song? No. <laughs> I, I move that we adjourn. Yes. Second that motion. All in favor. Aye. Aye. <laughs> uh, and that concludes our meeting. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye. Take care. Bye-bye.